archives, as you all know, is one of our great national treasures. And it's, uh, uh, without a place like this, it would be impossible for us to understand anything about our history, particularly about uh, troublesome, nettlesome issues like Iran-Contra. And uh, the archivists that, that I've worked with and many of my colleagues have worked with over the years, uh, including at the, um, the, the section that deals with independent counsel investigations, have been uh, phenomenal and incredibly helpful, as have all the Freedom of Information Act uh, professionals who are out there laboring behind the scenes. So um, I'm going to talk just as, as briefly as I can about this. This is a 460-something page book uh, about an incredibly complicated scandal. Most of you here seem to be about my age, so you remember you know, a good bit about what happened probably, but I imagine that there's a lot that happened that may surprise you that you either didn't know about uh, or that you forgot about in the welter of, of uh, news stories and coverage that, that uh, flooded our senses for several years back in the 80s and early 90s. Um, so I'm going to focus today on really one overarching point, which is that Iran-Contra was not just about, uh, you know, little foot soldiers running around the world and carrying out crazy antics and covert operations. This was more fundamentally, more importantly, about actions taken and decisions made at the top levels of our government, whence the subtitle of, uh, of this volume. Um, now, so I'm going to go through some slides as I do that, and I hope that they'll help flesh out the story a little bit. So the story, as we will talk about it today, starts back in the fall of 1986 just about halfway through Ronald Reagan's second term in office. Uh, as you remember, at that time, we were still in the midst of the Cold War. Uh, Mikhail Gorbachev had come to power the year before. Uh, Star Wars were, was in the air. The Chernobyl disaster had happened. Uh, all kinds of things were, were uh, either uh, were imminent. Uh, the famous Reykjavik summit was about to happen in October. Um, but in early October, on October 5th, if you may recall, a news flash occurred that a, a small rickety cargo plane flying over the jungles of Nicaragua had gotten shot down. And produced a single survivor, the gentleman down in the lower part of the, the lower picture, named Eugene Hassenfuss who was from Marinette, Wisconsin, a, an ex-Marine. Uh, it took a, you know, a few hours for, for the, the Sandinistas to, to find him uh, and to drag him before international television cameras where he told his story. The story he told was that he had been working for the CIA. He had been ferrying weapons to the so-called Contra rebels in Nicaragua. The Contras were, as you remember, fighting the Sandinistas. Uh, who had, uh, in 1979, overthrown the longtime U.S. ally, Anastasio Somoza. Um, the problem with what Hassenfuss admitted to doing was that this was entirely against the law. Uh, Congress, a, a couple of years earlier, had specifically prohibited any U.S.-sponsored efforts to support the Contras, uh, and this was the, the first really clear evidence that uh, something was afoot. Now, one month later, an even more bizarre story appeared coming out of Lebanon from a small Shiite publication called Ashira, saying that the U.S. had been uh, engaged in negotiations with the Islamic Republic of Iran over the fate of American hostages being held in Lebanon by Hezbollah, Iran's uh, proxy, believed at the time. It went on to say, this story, that uh, the U.S. national security advisor at the time Bud McFarlane, Robert McFarlane, who's in the lower picture on the left, um, had actually visited Iran to engage in these negotiations and had brought with him sensitive U.S. military equipment, missiles uh, in, among them, to provide to the Ayatollahs in exchange for the release of these American hostages. Now, you have to remember that at that time, Iran, as it is now, was a, a mortal enemy of the United States. It was on the State Department's terrorism list. Uh, it would uh, only been what, six or seven years before that uh, the, the Tehran hostage crisis had taken place, 444 days of captivity for over 50 Americans. Uh, Ronald Reagan had made it a, a central part of his political platform 
in his presidential campaign and while he was in office to uh, make life miserable for terrorists. They would have no place to hide. Uh, this was a founding principle of his foreign policy. And yet, here was this story that seemed to say just the opposite. But that was not the end of it. Just a couple of weeks later, uh, on November 25th, 1986, two days before Thanksgiving, Reagan and his uh, attorney general, Ed Meese, uh, announced that they were going to have a press conference, and they did have a press conference at noon uh, on that day, where they revealed that after weeks of uh, outright denials of the Hassenfo story and a sharp playing down of the Iran story, initial denials, but then more complicated, vague, uh, sort of you know, non-denial denials, to borrow a Watergate phrase, uh, they declared that, in fact, in substance, both of those stories were true. And not only that, they uh, revealed that they had discovered just a couple of days earlier that the two episodes, the two operations, had been connected. How had they been connected? They had been connected by uh, the use of profits from the arms sales to Iran, because these were not just hostage for missile swaps. This was a sale of weapons to Iran. Uh, the notion was that profits from those sales were diverted to help the rebels in Nicaragua despite the congressional ban on U.S. support. So this is what put the hyphen in Iran-Contra, and it was a, a huge story. Now, one of the main points that Reagan made in his roughly four-minute presentation, followed by me speaking for about 45 minutes, was that he had been totally unaware of this connection. Instead, the villains that were pointed out were, on the bottom right, a familiar figure, Oliver North, a Marine Lieutenant Colonel who was detailed to the National Security Council staff. Uh, it was said to be, this, this diversion, so-called, was said to be his idea. And uh, also, the other one was the, the National Security Advisor at the time, who replaced McFarlane, Admiral John Poindexter, up at the top left, uh, who was said to have approved this, but not to have told the President about it. Uh, now, this was, you can imagine what the moment was like if you don't remember it specifically. This was an incredibly dramatic uh, moment. Uh, Eleanor Clift, who was a, a Newsweek correspondent at the time, said you could hear people all suck in their breath. It was that kind of story. Why? Because it was an admission of uh, basically corrupt, potentially and arguably illegal acts being committed by members of the White House staff. What could be juicier than that? So the result was that uh, uh, virtually everybody in the media, everybody in Congress, and uh, those of us in the public were essentially sent down that trail to follow that story. The media, uh, after years of uh, frustration of trying to pin something on the Teflon president, finally seemed to have something that they could, could, uh, could get him with, and they were determined, by and large, to try to uh, prove or disprove the assertion that the president had been ignorant of this, uh, this potentially illegal action. Now, it turns out that this really was only part of the story, and this is one of the central points that I make in the book and that, uh, that I think explains why Iran-Contra is seen in one light as sort of the acts of uh, cowboys in the basement of the White House, when in fact uh, it involved much higher up, much more senior officials. So as one skeptical journalist, one of the few who was at the press conference, asked, he said, what is to prevent, he asked this of Ed Meese, what is to prevent an increasingly cynical public from thinking that you went looking for a scapegoat and you came up with this whopper of a diversion, but it doesn't have a lot to do with the original controversy. Now, it so happens that Ali North had the same idea. As he writes in his memoir, the diversion of profits he says, was itself a diversion of a different kind. He writes, this particular detail was so dramatic, so sexy, that it might actually, well, divert public attention from other, even more important aspects of the story, such as what else the president and his top advisors had known about and approved. Now, I happen to subscribe wholly to that theory, so that's a central part of this book. Now, later on, Reagan's aides would claim, and Reagan himself would claim, that he had been largely kept in the dark by people like North and Poindexter, 
uh, and other advisors who did not fill him in on critical parts of, uh, of the story and the details. But it's very clear from records that are, are available at the National Archives and the Presidential Library and so on uh, that, in fact, Reagan met regularly with top aides, uh, was explained in detail what the situation was in Iran, what it meant to uh, be involved with uh, hostage negotiations and trading missiles and so on, uh, and that he understood perfectly what was going on. So I'm going to just give you one example uh, to make this point. This is a set of handwritten notes by Defense Secretary Caspar Weinberger, who was one of the, the strongest opponents of this Iran operation, along with George Shultz, the Secretary of State. And it's from December 7th, 1985, so a, a few months into the operations, which began in August of 85. Um, it's a meeting in the family quarters of the White House with Schultz, Weinberger, uh, several other officials, McFarlane, um, Poindexter, and the quote that is impossible for you and I to read, but thanks to investigators, they transcribed it for us, and I'll just read the key part of it. Weinberger writes, I argued strongly that we have an embargo that makes arms sales to Iran illegal and President couldn't veto it. Plus, that washing, quote unquote, through Israel, who was one of our partners in this operation, wouldn't make it legal. President said he could answer charges of illegality, but he couldn't answer charge that, quote, big, strong President Reagan passed up a chance to free the hostages. It's hard to get more explicit than that. Now, there were also potentially uh, dangerous revelations to be had on the Contra side of the story. And the most significant one uh, had to do with various fundraising activities that uh, the President, the Vice President, members of his cabinet, and others were undertaking that, in fact, were very similar to the, the kinds of things that North was accused of doing and, and acknowledged doing, too, uh, getting money to the Contras when it was banned by Congress, and even using this diversion of profits. That was just a way to get, uh, get money to the Contras. So, uh, the problem was that, that senior officials during the same congressional ban had regularly made contact with uh, foreign governments to do the exact same thing, to try to get money, weapons, uh, supplies of various kinds to the Contras. Um, who were we asking for this? Saudi Arabia, uh, Taiwan, South Africa, Honduras, El Salvador. Up to about two dozen of these countries were involved. And this was all in spite of warnings by no less than Secretary Schultz that all of this could be uh, extremely problematic legally and, and otherwise. So this is a set of, of minutes from a meeting, a top-level meeting called the National Security Planning Group from June 25, 1984. Now this is before the main congressional restriction called the Boland Amendment came into effect. Uh, but they were already anticipating that there would be a complete cutoff of aid and they were trying to figure out what to do. So this is a discussion of the president and his top advisors about what, what, how are we going to keep the Contras alive? What are we going to do about this? And at one point, um, it's hard to read this, but uh, up near the top there, that it's, uh, Secretary Schultz makes several points. Um, his third one is, I would like to get money for the Contras also, but another lawyer, Jim Baker, James Baker, who everybody we all know in Washington, said that if we go out and try to get money from third countries, it is an impeachable offense. Now imagine saying that with the president sitting right next to you. That's, the, you know, the I word is a very difficult one to, to, uh, uh, to work with. Now immediately, Mr. Casey there, which, who's uh, William Casey, the director of CIA, says, I am entitled to complete the record. And he, he argues that, that uh, Baker didn't understand the full story, and then, in fact, that you know, this is going to be perfectly legitimate. And they go on for a few pages discussing this, this point. And at the end, they decide that they are going to hold off on any more discussion or activities related to third country funding uh, until they get an official opinion from the Attorney General, who at that point was William French Smith. Um, I'm just going to go to the next page just as a little insight into how some of these other officials looked on these things. Up at the top, this is the last page of the same set of minutes. Vice President Bush, George H.W. Bush. How can anyone object to the U.S. encouraging third countries to provide help to the anti-Sandinistas under the finding, a findings of pre presidential uh, approval document? 
The only problem that might come up is if the United States were to promise to give these third parties something in return so that some people could interpret this as some kind of an exchange. Then uh, down below, Mr. McFarlane, who's still the National Security Advisor at this point, says, I propose there be no further, no authority for anyone to seek third party support for the anti-Sandinistas until we have the information we need from the Attorney General. And I certainly hope none of this discussion will be made public in any way. And then President Reagan, who a lot of you know, characterists saw as the guy asleep at the wheel, never paid attention, couldn't remember your name, uh, was passive to the core. Uh, he, he ends with this nice little note. He says, if such a story goes, gets out, we'll all be hanging by our thumbs in front of the White House until we find out who did it. Now, I think that's a little bit tongue in cheek, and he's, he's really talking about trying to keep a lid on this. We don't want anybody to talk about it. Uh, but it's one of, of dozens of examples that you find in, in records like this of Reagan being extremely active, extremely engaged, coming up with ideas, you know, uh, trying to push the, the group to, to be more active. It's a very different portrait than, than some of his opponents uh, present. Okay, so the next day what happens is that William Casey goes and sees William French Smith to get his opinion. And French Smith says, you know, in fact, it is okay to approach third countries, provided you do a couple of things. One is, as Bush anticipated, you cannot make it appear in any way as if there's going to be some kind of, of a payback for this. They have to volunteer this, make their, their support available without any promise or any inkling of a quid pro quo. Number two, you got to notify Congress. Other than that, it's pretty much okay. Well, in fact, they went ahead, contacted all of these governments, the Saudis in particular. The Saudis ended up giving $32 million to the Contras. Taiwan gave a couple million, and there are others. Um, in each case, it is very clear from the record, either directly, explicitly, or implied, that there was this sense of a quid pro quo. In fact, at one point, uh, Elliot Abrams, who was Assistant Secretary of State, approached a representative of the Sultan of Brunei in a famous uh, encounter uh, that was to yield $10 million, except it fell through. Um, and it, as he complained, he said that the, the guy he was speaking with kept saying, well, what's in it for us? Explicitly, and, and Abrams would say, well, you, you get the eternal gratitude of the President of the United States and the Secretary of State. And he's like, well, that's fine, but what else are we going to get out of it? So there was no question whatsoever what, uh, what was uh, expected out of this. Okay. Uh, so the, my point is that while it, there's no doubt whatsoever that people like Ollie North and, uh, and the folks that he worked with, he set up a whole uh, thing called the Enterprise, uh, which was a group of, you know, of uh, front companies and private individuals who were out to make money as much as anything else. While they undoubtedly did the things that we all have, uh, have read about, uh, setting up these companies, getting weapons to the Contras, dealing with, with bad guys here and there, um, that's all true. But the even bigger story that never got developed until years afterwards was that the president, vice president, members of the cabinet were also involved doing similar things. Now, the reasons why those sides of the scandal were basically suppressed uh, become clear during the third phase, what I consider the third phase of the scandal, which is the aftermath, after the Iran and Contra operations are exposed in uh, late 1986. And what happens at that point is that uh, various members of the administration, including all these folks here, that's Caspar Weinberger, George Schultz, Ed Meese, Don Regan, the chief of staff, and the president, uh, all together and separately went about doing what people do in, in moments like this in Washington. You start covering your tracks. You start engaging in damage control. The dirty word for that is cover-up. This picture was, in fact, taken on November 25th, 1986, the day of the press conference, and they're all looking suitably uh, mortified uh, about uh, what is going to happen because this is a, this is a, a huge scandal for them. Um, right after the exposure of, of all these operations, one of the, the things that the, the White House did was they, they brought in some outside damage control experts, Howard Baker, the former senator and the veteran of Watergate uh, investigations came in to, to, uh, to help out. Um, a, a, a former ambassador named David Abshire 
was brought in essentially to be the czar, the Iran-Contra czar, and figure out how to clean things up. Um, the Iran-Contra congressional chief counsel on the Senate side, Arthur Lyman, uh, who became famous to us on our TV screens the summer of 87, uh, later wrote that when he made his first trip to the White House to interview people in the early part of 1987, he said the place had the smell of death about it. And when you read memoirs of other uh, people who were involved in it, they, there's just a, a picture of uh, essentially chaos and, and uh, uh, a lack of, of any direction other than to find way in, in policy of any sort, uh, including arms control and, and Soviet relations, very critical things. Uh, because everybody's attention was focused on trying to figure out how to put a lid on this, on this thing. Um, one of the most stunning stories to me is not one that I uncovered, but it was reported uh, by Jane Mayer and Doyle McManus, then of the LA Times, uh, in a book that they wrote called Landslide, was a story of Baker, Howard Baker, uh, at one point bringing in a, a former advisor to Gerald Ford, uh, named Jim Cannon, to come in and investigate these very unsettling stories that they were hearing about this kind of chaos in the White House and just general uh, malaise, to borrow from Jimmy Carter, uh, based on this notion that, that President Reagan had become totally disengaged and that he was not running the show and, and nobody knew what was going on. And Cannon goes in and, according to McManus and Mayer, uh, interviews a bunch of White House staffers and uh, gets his own sense of the lay of the land and is so troubled that uh, he writes a memo to Baker and the others where he proposes consideration of invoking the 25th Amendment, which is uh, designed to remove the president in case of incompetence. And if that doesn't send shivers down your spine about uh, the state of play there and the state of, of President Reagan's uh, mental uh, situation, then... Um, you know, that, that, that's a tough one to match. Now, what happens is, according to David Abshire, the, the ex-ambassador, uh, he and Baker are, are, you know, of course worried about this, but then they go and make their own little rounds, and they go and visit the president to talk to him. And they walk into the room, and Reagan looks at them cheerfully, uh, makes a joke, uh, you know, looks great, looks like the Gipper, and uh, in a, a flash of an eye, the two of them, Baker and Abshire, look at each other and basically say, there's no problem here. He's, he's in great shape. This is terrific. And off they go, and they purportedly don't think about this again. I just find that really hard to believe. There's not a lot of, of uh, there's certainly no records to, to, uh, that are available that you can uh, look at. Uh, and one of the great difficulties of this story is that everybody that you might want to talk to has their own perspective on this, their own political perspective, and it's extremely difficult to parse all of this. That was one of the biggest challenges of doing this book for me. But I don't see how you could take uh, the, the recommendation of someone that you have brought in yourself uh, who has invoked this incredibly serious option and on the strength of a single encounter uh, one morning with the president, you decide that, that none of that has any substance. But that's just part of the story. <laughs> All right. Now, finally, in uh, late November 86, so just before this press conference happens, with all of this kind of semi-controlled and uncontrolled pandemonium going on in the White House where everybody, it's, it's not just everybody circling around the president trying to protect him. It's clear that that's happening. But everybody's looking out for themselves, too, um, a perfectly natural kind of thing. But the, the problem is that it, it, um, it, 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 uh, it completely distorts the story of what's really happening. Um, at this point, Ed Meese, who is essentially protector in chief for the president, considers himself as uh, Reagan's one of his closest personal advisors, decides that it's time for him to step in and conduct what he called an investigation or an inquiry. Uh, but there was something, as you may recall, that, that came under uh, serious uh, discrediting later on because it was clearly not a fact finding uh, Justice Department type inquiry. He was the Attorney General, after all. It was part of this damage control operation. Um, at first, Meese settled on a story that uh, featured a president, again, as I said earlier, being uh, protected, if you will, from the, the facts of what was going on in Iran, and particularly the question of whether or not the arms sales that he had approved had been approved legally, appropriately, and so on. 
um, he decided that the president had not known. The problem was that both George Shultz and Robert McFarlane told him specifically that the president had informed them that he had known uh, all about what was going on and had been uh, uh, specific as well. Uh, that was when they, Mies decided that he had a real problem on his hands. But before the whole thing had time to explode, well, let me see. Yeah, let me go here first. Um, it's almost as if Providence intervened. This was at a time when Mies sent a couple of his investigators to the NSC, uh, to Ali North's office, to look for information, find out what's going on. And lo and behold, they discovered, his two uh, advisors discovered this memo that North had written. This is just an extract of the memo that at the very top says uh, the following. The residual funds from this transaction, which is the trans a transaction with Iran, uh, are allocated as follows. And it says down there, 12 million will be used to purchase critically needed supplies for the Nicaraguan Democratic Resistance Forces. This became known as the diversion memo. This is what uh, ended up being the, the substance behind Mises' assertion and the President's assertion that there had been this diversion and the President had known nothing about it. Um, it, it, was, uh, it was turned out to be the saving grace, the saving you know, blow for, um, for the President because it deflected everybody's attention from a variety of arguably illegal activities that they themselves understood they had taken part in uh, but prevented that from being the true focus of, uh, of subsequent investigations. Now, I had included a couple of things here just to give you a sense of a flavor of what the atmosphere was like in that late November, December time period of 86. Uh, so here is, as it says, extract from Vice President Bush's diary, which he started on November 4th, 1986, uh, which was a, a day after the Iran revelation came out, interestingly enough. So down below, it's hard to see there, on November 5th, um, he makes the following comment. And this is important in the context of the big question of what did Vice President Bush know? If you recall, Bush was about to run for president in 1988 and was extremely interested in uh, essentially uh, you know, staying as far from this scandal as he possibly could. And he denied being in the cockpit. He said, I was out of the loop on Iran. I didn't know anything that was going on. So here's November 5th, 86. On the news at this time is the question of the hostages. There was some discussion of Bud McFarlane having been held prisoner in Iran for four days. Not quite right, but uh, he was in Tehran. I'm one of the few people that know fully the details. And there was a lot of flack and misinformation out, out there. It is not a subject we can talk about. All right, so, so much for his being out of the loop. Now here, uh, next couple of items are notes that were taken by a close aide of George Schultz, who was deeply troubled by all that was going on. Um, and Schultz would go to these meetings in the White House and come back to the State Department and basically just, you know, uh, uh, get debriefed by his advisors. But there, there's a lot of angst in these notes. And these notes are terrific. They're detailed. And uh, not least, they are legible, which is really, really helpful. I'll just read the one part at the bottom. Well, no, I'm going to read a little bit more. At the top, he says, our credibility is shot. We have taken refuge in tricky technicalities of language to avoid confronting the reality that we have lied to the American people and misused our friends abroad. We are revealed to have been dealing with some of the sleaziest international characters around. They have played us for suckers. There is a Watergate-like atmosphere around here. The White House staff has gotten increasingly secretive, self-deluding, and vindictive. This is in early November. Uh, a little bit later on, a couple days later, down at the bottom, he's uh, a similar type of a meeting. He says, I don't mean to CF, right, to compare it directly, but sort of like Watergate. They get in and can't get out, and so stonewall and get in deeper. And then finally, um, so this is a couple of days before the press conference, and this is one of the, the little bits of evidence that I use to support my argument about the president's role. Um, I meaning Schultz, told, and that's the letter P, this is the, the symbol that was used for the president in these notes, I told President Thursday of what Bud, Bud McFarlane, told me about November 85, which is a, a particular uh, missile shipment to Iran that Mies was saying that uh, Reagan had not known about. He said he knew it. When dug into, will be shown that President pushed these people. So 
this is not a case of Reagan being kept in the dark and, uh, and things happening all, all around him that he was unaware of. He was very aware of what was going on. Okay. All right, so uh, there is plenty more to talk about. I mean, the, the shenanigans that went on, the, you know, the cakes and the Bibles and the pistols that went to Iran, the, uh, you know, the dealing with, with fake Saudi princes, the, the dealings with Manuel Noriega to uh, cut a deal with him to you know, improve his image in return for his help with the Contras, uh, just amazing things that happened that, that fill the pages of this book. Uh, are, are things I would love to talk about if you have questions later, but I, I can't really get into them now. There's just too many of them. But what I would like to do just to wrap this up is to uh, talk about some of the, the, the takeaways, of which there are plenty, but I'll just give you a couple. Uh, first is that I think this story offers incredibly important insights into the Reagan administration, uh, into the president himself, who was one of the most fascinating uh, political characters of our time, uh, and it's, it's information and insights that you just wouldn't get from the official record that was produced by the administration. No administration would have done anything different, I don't believe. Um, but I don't think that you can understand fully his character or the actions of our government in this time period without knowing this story. The second point is that the affair was, uh, although it was downplayed by uh, by defenders of the administration as being just a, a series of mistakes and miscalculations and, and all very innocent. Uh, in fact, it, it, uh, it had very significant effects and it was a, a critically important episode. It had effects in the region. Of course, it prolonged a war in, in Central America that most Americans throughout the Reagan presidency disapproved of. This is why the administration took the whole policy underground and went covert to begin with because they could not persuade Congress or the public uh, on any consistent to pursue a more aggressive policy against the Sandinistas. Uh, in the Persian Gulf region, it, it had uh, also uh, very significant effects. And I argue that uh, in the aftermath, in the, the period where the administration attempted to make up for the, um, the diplomatic uh, uh, sort of fallout from this, re these revelations, the US got itself much more deeply involved in the region, escorting tankers. and uh, and actually engaging in firefights with Iranians and getting, uh, uh, putting Americans in, in harm's way and in fact losing American lives uh, and many innocent Iranian lives. The, the, uh, the famous shooting down of the Airbus in uh, July 1988 that killed a couple of hundred Iranians. All of these were results of a desire, and this is from interviews with uh, U.S. officials and diplomats, uh, a desire by the administration to sort of make up for the gaffe that, uh, that this affair represented. Uh, domestically, I argue that the affair was both exposed and heightened the level of hyper-partisanship uh, that we now see in spades uh, in, in our current times. Um, it also exposed, and I devote at least three chapters of the book to this, it exposed the, the tremendous inadequacies, the ineffectiveness of both Congress and our legal system in pursuing and redressing problems of this sort. Um, it's worth bearing in mind just one particular point, that neither of these episodes was uncovered by anybody's investigation, not Congress, not the media, although the media was on to parts of the story on the Contra side, uh, and not our, our Justice Department or our legal system. The Iran episode was purely a function of, of uh, regional politics, the story that came out in that Lebanese newspaper was designed to embarrass the Iranian officials who were involved in this. And on the Contra side, it was this, you know, the teenage Sandinista soldier who got a lucky shot off with his RPG and winged this decrepit old uh, cargo plane and produced Eugene Hassenfuss. Without those two events, who knows what we would have ever discovered about this, if we, if we ever would have found out uh, what happened. All right. Um, finally, I, it, you, there are just so many great lessons uh, to be learned and parallels to today. You just have to look at, at our headlines from the last you know, uh, weeks, months, uh, even in today's paper. There are stories about uh, Congress worrying about a president who is acting too much on his own authorities, arrogating too much power to himself, behaving unconstitutionally, keeping Congress in the dark. Uh, you know, we're trying to figure out ways to deal with Iran. 
We don't know how to deal with, with the hostage crisis that's going on with uh, ISIS. Uh, there are questions about how to pursue you know, covert operations and uh, all kinds of issues that, uh, uh, that we're seeing, um, ironically, from the other side now. Back then, it was Democrats versus a, a, a Republican president. Now it's the opposite. And it just uh, shows you that the, really there was nothing new under the sun. So um, not a happy story, not some not very positive lessons or things to take out of it, but incredibly important. And uh, I'd be very happy to answer any questions about it that you might have. Thank you. If you have questions, if you could go to one of these microphones on either side of the, uh, the auditorium, please. Yes, sir. Thank you. Very interesting. Just a clarification. Uh, you mentioned at one point that the, uh, the, the position was deny, deny, deny. What was the concern do you feel that was going to come out? You mentioned the shoot down and some other things. But it sounds like to their own reason, they decided to release the story. And I'm just curious why that might have been. And then it, I guess once it was out, who would you guess would be the advisor to the president to say, uh, you can't remember, or I don't know where I was, or any of that kind of stuff. Wait, what's the last part? Who who would have advised that? Who would have said, "Yeah, you're 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 not in this. You're you're confused, or whatever." Uh, well, there are are notes that people have taken from the time that talk about that. There are meetings on November 10th, 1986, um, and and elsewhere around that time period. So after the first revelations, where it's very clear that the, a story is being put forward by people like uh, John Poindexter, the National Security Advisor, and later on Ed Meese, uh, where they are, are saying these very things. The president did not know that this had happened. Uh, and you know, they don't, it's not one of these things where they come out and say, OK, here's our story, and everybody OK with this? We're going to stick with it. It's not far from that, though. You, know, you can imagine that's not the kind of thing that you would say in a meeting of that sort. But uh, what you have are the notes of several participants that all more or less comport with each other. And then you have George Schultz coming back to the department going, I can't believe what's going on here. Uh, and, and very vividly complaining about how these guys are putting the president into a corner and it's going to come out that he was behind this and, and all hell's going to break loose. And then there are other uh, you know, bits of evidence like um, one of the main participants, Richard Secord, a retired general who worked with Ollie North, uh, who called John Poindexter on the day of this press conference and said, you've got to do something about it. And Poindexter's response is, it's too late. They're building a wall around the president. That's basically a quote. So there's a lot of, of evidence that shows that this was uh, what was going on. Uh, now, as far as whether they released the story or not, this is one of the, the trickier parts of this because uh, these guys had as their their, their sort of antecedent, Watergate, right? What was the big lesson of Watergate for, uh, at, at one level anyway, which is don't cover up. Don't look like you're covering up. Now, added to this is President Reagan's firm belief that he had done nothing wrong. Uh, the, this picture on the cover is from a, a March 87 speech that he made, which was the first time, after much pressure from Nancy Reagan and Don Regan and other people, uh, and David Abshire, he finally comes out and says, OK, it looks like we traded arms for hostages. And he says, I've got the quote in here somewhere. Uh, he says, basically, my heart tells me that we did not do it, but the facts tell me that we did. The facts and the evidence tell me that we did. That's a great insight into what he was thinking about this. He thought, I wasn't doing anything wrong. I wasn't trading arms with hostages, with um, hostage takers. Hezbollah were the hostage takers, not Iran in this case. It's a, it's a, a sort of a leap of logic there. Um, but these things come together to produce a, uh, an approach that is designed to show maximum openness. They didn't declare executive privilege. They released hundreds of thousands of documents to investigators. But what's critical is that what they didn't release. And this is a huge reason, uh, part of the reason, for why we didn't get the full story. Uh, it, it didn't sink in to the American public as, as much as it should. Uh, and the, the main instance of this was the withholding of personal notes of the kind that you're seeing here, from George Schultz's aide, from Cap Weinberger, from Donald Regan, uh, from George Bush, 
All of these guys were uh, importuned regularly by the Office of Independent Counsel to produce any notes, personal diaries, any of these materials that you have. None of them did it for years. It took uh, you know, four or five years before they finally started to come through with them. And now we have them. We don't have them all released, but they're at the National Archives. You can, you can see parts of them. Uh, and they are what paint the most devastating picture of what was going on at the time. And it's very clear why they withheld them. But, and as I say, any administration would probably do the same thing. Um, this is not a, you know, a partisan issue when you come down to it. This is the way governments behave, and people in power often behave um, when they're backed into a corner. But that is, that's the, the, the pudding that is the proof, if you will. There was a, a desire to, at a minimum, appear to be as open as possible. But there is very clearly an awareness that um, several things could happen at one level. Congress could cut off funding for the Contras for good. That was really what they didn't want. But then on a more personal level, as, as things started to escalate, there's the clear awareness, like, holy cow, I could personally be in deep trouble here. Ali North changes his tune as soon as he finds out that he could face jail time. At that point, he starts singing. And it's pretty much the same uh, with the others. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very, it, it makes the story a lot harder to uh, to sort through because there are so many different versions and so many different games being played. Uh, but it's also part of what makes it more fascinating. So. Did they think it would just, you know, we'll be honest and everybody will go, okay, thanks, and move on to the next thing? What, I mean... Are you asking, is that what they thought? What, you, you, someone that's made the decision, we're going to be honest, and somehow this honesty will result in a minimal uh, overview, and it didn't turn out that way. I'm just curious what what the logic would be, that but, it would be closure because we're honest, and that's it. Well, almost nobody argued for complete honesty, is the irony. Um, Schultz wanted to get the story out, but the, the records show that he was opposed by Casey, by Poindexter, and even by Reagan, and, and by Bush. Uh, not because they thought, well, you know, we, we're all going to go to jail necessarily, although there was that concern. Uh, but there were, there were political concerns. They were worried about impeachment. I mean, imagine another president. Imagine Barack Obama having been found to be sending missiles to the Islamic Republic of Iran without having notified Congress, without having done any of the legal uh, you know, uh, work that is required by law to happen. An unpopular president with a, a, a Congress feeling its oats would have produced a very different result than what was the case with a popular president and, uh, I would argue, a largely um, you know, um, skittish Congress, Democrats in Congress who did not want to go too far uh, in being seen as attacking a popular president. Thank you. Thank you. Yes? Is it uh, given the sieve that Washington is that uh, this was not a major issue in the uh, 1988 presidential campaign. It, it was a big issue. Um, there was so much ink spilled on this story, as you probably recall, and so, man, so many hours of TV time. The irony is, and it goes to the, the previous set of questions, um, that you had on the one hand an unbelievable outflow of information. On the other hand, the key details were being withheld. Um, so we did not have, at the time of the 88 election, Bush's notes saying, I knew everything that was going on. What we had was his word against the word of reporters like Dan Rather, if you remember the famous confrontation between Rather and, and Bush on TV, uh, that by all accounts Bush won because Rather came across as, as being you know, too, uh, uh, too crude and, and, and not respectful enough. And Bush just kept saying, as, as many in the administration did, this is old news. This has all been covered before. We're, we're just repeating old stuff. Um, and they carried the day. Part of the, the issue was also that the, the issues themselves were pretty murky. You know, you have a popular president who is not uh, seen to be politically corrupt the way Nixon was. He was doing what he thought was right. He did it in a just profoundly mis, you know, uh, misconceived way. But his instincts and his objectives were seen by many Americans as perfectly OK. Um, on the other hand, you had uh, Congress and, and the Independent Council being shown, uh, being portrayed as uh, 
as you know, aggressive, vindictive, and uh, you know, coming up against the likes of, of other popular figures like Ali North. You remember Ali in his uniform with all his medals sitting upright and, and taking it to Congress where you had, I mean, literally they had these discussions where, where a couple of the investigators and, and lawyers on the congressional side, there was John Neals was the chief um, house um, counsel, and he had long hair down to here. And uh, there were other people who were seen or portrayed to be uh, as kind of, you know, anti-establishment or, you know, not true blue the way Ollie North was. All of these sort of PR type factors came into play to uh, sort of take the air out of the, uh, of the issues. And uh, it, it worked to the administration's favor. It's, a, it's part of the fascinating part of the story. It's, you know, what, who's right, who's wrong, what's good, what's bad. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, the, you could busy yourself for many days having these kinds of discussions, and they're very valid ones. Yes, sir. Any of the last days of um, President Wilson, what did, in reading all of these notes, did any of the, his close advisors have any concerns about um, the president's mental well-being? Yeah, uh, they, they did, as far as I can tell. And again, it's, it's, it's not something that you're going to find a lot of documentation about. This, this story about Jim Cannon and his invoking the 25th Amendment is, is the most dramatic. Um, but when you read between the lines of some of these notes, you do definitely get the sense uh, that, uh, that there were concerns. And it's also, it's part of, and in my reading of it anyway, it's part of the rationale that Ed Meese came up with for saying the president didn't know about this. When George Shultz tells him, no, wait a minute, I told the president, and the president you know, told me that he knew about it, Mies makes this, this comment that is rendered a little bit vaguely in the notes, but what it boils down to, as I read it, is, yeah, but he doesn't remember. And you can sort of see that you know, that's something that, that uh, may be justified, may not be justified, but can act as a rationale. If he didn't remember, if he didn't know in his own mind what was happening, how can you, how can anybody really attack him for it? Yes, ma'am. I was curious, in the beginning, who initiated the releasing of the hostages? Was it more of an Iran approaching the administration and saying, um, you know, we'll release the hostages if you give us this arms shipment or vice versa? Yeah. Uh, if, if I had another hour, I would love to tell you the whole thing. Uh, what it boiled down to was a perfect storm of conditions. Bud McFarlane and a few others in the administration really wanted a strategic opening to Iran. Why? Because they were afraid that with the US loss of Iran in 1979, when the Shah was overthrown, that would leave the way open for the Soviets to come in. That's the big worry in this dark period of the Cold War that we're still in. Um, he wasn't able to get his idea past people like Schultz and Weinberger, which was to allow for our allies to provide small amounts of weapons to Iran as a way to get them the, the message that they didn't have to go to the Soviets for that kind of thing. You could still rely on us. We'll, we'll help you out. That was his idea. Schultz and Weinberger just dumped all over it. And there's some great documents that talk about that. Um, while this is going on, of course, Iran and Iraq are engaged in mortal combat. Iran has an American-based, uh, you know, um, army, military. They need, above all, American equipment to keep going. At the same time, arms dealers are circling like sharks in the water, and there are a couple of them that come up with this idea to approach Israel. Uh, Manager Gorbanifar is the, is the main guy, and he works with the Saudi billionaire Adnan Khashoggi to approach the Israelis and say, how about it? You guys have American equipment. Why don't you provide it to them? Well, the Israelis couldn't do that without checking with us. Um, at the same time, an NSC staff consultant named uh, Michael Ledeen uh, is hot on the trail of uh, a lead that he's been given, uh, which boils down to the fact that the Israelis seem to have uh, the potential to get past the veil, if you will, in Iran and, and start you know, working out some dealings with Iranians who may be more amenable to a, a, a renewed relationship with the United States than we're led to believe in public. Um, so you have on the, the military level, on the arms dealing level, on the political level, all of these, these uh, 
people and forces coming into play that lead Shimon Peres of Israel to say, you know, I want to do Reagan a favor. He's done favors for us before. Let's go tell them that we have this possibility of, of, uh, uh, of, of an opening with Iran that will, at a minimum, provide a lot of valuable intelligence about what's going on. Approach them and see what they think. And they send a, an envoy to talk to McFarlane. Uh, the key phrase in, the, in their discussion is the idea that as a sign of both sides' goodwill, the Americans are providing a small amount of weapons to Iran, and the Iranians might consider uh, trying to get our hostages released from Hezbollah. How would that fly? And uh, McFarlane just, you know, he sees that this is where it's going to go, approaches Reagan, who is recovering in the hospital from his polyp surgery, and uh, Reagan, uh, within a matter of days, says, absolutely, let's go for it. And this is uh, one of the crux, cruxes of the story, is that while some people thought that this would be a great way to, to form an opening with Iran, and Reagan was, was you know, he, he got it, but clearly, from every piece of evidence, what really motivated Reagan was getting those hostages out. And uh, when, when McFarland was able to put that together, that was how that got started. Did, did so this you don't scan have to read chapters three through nine now. You've got it all. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Did this scandal have um, tentacles that led to the uh, crack cocaine epidemic in this country and the war on drugs? Uh, that's a great question, and my answer is partially. Um, there was a, a book and a movie called The Dark Alliance uh, that came out based on reporting by a reporter from California who later committed suicide, partly because he was completely discredited and unjustly, in my point of view. Um, what he pointed out was the fact that Contra, elements of the Contras in Nicaragua, who the U.S. was working with, knew, uh, not only knew about, but were involved in drug dealing. His, this reporter's stories, I believe, took the story too far in saying that uh, the drugs that these Contras were dealing with were essentially the spark that created the crack epidemic, not just in Los Angeles, but in the United States. I think that's a vast overreach. But there is no doubt, and why? Because we have CIA records that, that uh, confirm it, that people like Ollie North and the CIA folks that he was working with understood perfectly well. I've even got some sample documents that I don't have time to show you understood perfectly well that there were elements of the Contras involved in this stuff. Um, but the CIA director, William Casey, got an agreement with the Justice Department before Meese with William French Smith that basically uh, allowed CIA operatives to legally turn a blind eye to things like that, I mean, specifically drug dealing, in order to pursue what they considered the more important objective of overthrowing the Sandinistas in, in any way that they could. So there's no question of a drug connection. Uh, this, the, the level and the significance of it is, uh, uh, is not as great as has been reported. We've yes, got uh, two more questions, Malcolm, and we're almost out of time, so if you could give us the abridged answer. Uh, <laughs> one question. Me too, but yeah. uh, how deeply was... Uh, Bill Casey's right-hand man, Robert Gates, involved in this scandal? Uh, great question, and um, the, the shortest version I can think of is that he was basically, as a colleague of mine, uh, Tom Blanton, who runs the National Security Archive, where I work, um, I, I think he was the first one to put it as he was the, the see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil guy. Um, the record shows that he uh, had very good reason to understand that things were happening that shouldn't be happening with the Contras, uh, and even knew about the diversion at some point late in the game, but before it all came out, uh, but that uh, he, he labored fairly hard to try to remove himself from, from um, any kind of scrutiny. And it, he paid a price. He was denied the position of director of CIA, if you remember, when uh, he tried to, uh, when he applied for the position. Um, and it was partly because of, of this, not entirely. But then, of course, he came back and, and was reborn. And, and you know, it's a, that's a great story of how you can overcome crisis and, and uh, live on to make, uh, make big contributions. Hello. Um, of course, during Watergate, there was Deep Throat. Uh, looking back, 
uh, was there enough for um, the media to actually put this story together, um, do you think, and actually break it into a much uh, wider story? Yeah, there, there was a lot there, and there were people in the media, uh, people like uh, Brian Barger um, and um, a, a couple of others from AP and, and let's say the Miami Herald and, and later on the Post and the Times and others and Wall Street Journal who did some incredible reporting. When, when this started really snowballing, if you go back and you look at all of the, the, um, uh, you know, the, the New York Times index or something, I mean, there, there are just hundreds of stories every, every week that are breaking loose new bits of information. Um, ironically, I think that was part of the problem. It was information overload, and the rest of us just kind of, you know, our eyes glazed over, and we couldn't put it all together. Uh, but there were bits of the story that had come out before, but it took these two events, the, the Lebanese publication uh, and the shooting down of that cargo plane to really pull the, the strands together. But it never got anywhere close to impeachment. Uh, it never got anywhere near that. Why is that? Well, I, I'm trying to keep it brief, but I, I think that, uh, again, it's a popular president. It's a Congress and, and Democrats who were loath to be seen as being too aggressive. Uh, Republicans will completely disagree with that. That, uh, that description. Um, also, Reagan was, was known to have mental issues, and he was also coming to the end of his uh, presidency. So if you're going to impeach somebody, and the point is to get him out of office, he's going to be out of office before you get far in the process. Anyway, that was part of the rationale. There were other considerations. They were worried about um, uh, a repeat of Watergate, which many Democratic leaders thought was, was too uh, disruptive for the nation to endure again. They were worried about the effect on arms control negotiations, making the Americans look weak. Um, but I come back to the point that if we had had access to these personal notes and this damning uh, evidence that was deliberately withheld for a number of years, if we had had that at the very get-go and you had been able to distill this story um, using that kind of, of evidence, there may well have been a, a different outcome. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it.